hang out um, to talk about the Olinguito. Um, we're ready to get started. Uh, just a reminder, uh, on the live broadcast page on YouTube, um, type your questions in the comment bar on the right, okay? And we'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can. Um, it's going to be English until about uh, 11.30. Y a las once y media comienza la poción en español. So Spanish from around 11.30. Okay. Um, my name is Chris Helgen. I'm uh, the head of mammals, head of mammalogy, here at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History, the largest natural history museum in the world. Now, yesterday morning, we made a big announcement. We announced the first scientific description of a new species of carnivora, the group of mammals that includes the mammalian carnivores, uh, in 35 years from the New World continents, North or South America. And this animal is something that we've called the Olinguito. It's a procyonid carnivore. It's in the raccoon family. And on average, it's the smallest member of the raccoon family. Now, I think you've probably seen some of the pictures of this animal. It's beautiful. It's adorable. And what we're here to do today is to celebrate this animal and its discovery, answer any questions you have uh, about, uh, about the underlying science or about the animal itself, and uh, let's get started. So I'm also, also with me, we have um, two of my colleagues, and we, uh, this was very much a team effort. And uh, uh, I have with me Roland Kays and Miguel Pinto, two other scientists, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Roland, you go ahead. Sure. My name is Roland Case. I'm the director of the Biodiversity Lab here at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences and also a professor at NC State, where I teach mammalogy. Hi, I am Miguel Pinto. <laughs> I am Miguel Pinto. I am from Ecuador. I am a researcher at the Pontificia Universidad Católica del Ecuador. I'm also a PhD student at the American Museum of Natural History and the City University of New York. Okay, great. So all three of us will be answering uh, questions, and uh, remember to type your questions in that comment bar to the right on the uh, the broadcast page on YouTube. So um, let's get started. Uh, I see a first question coming in here from Facebook. Um, the question is: Are any zoos planning to breed and show them? Any any uh, any any plans for olinguitos uh, in zoos? I can try to answer that. As far as I know, um, no. But remember, this is uh, only day two for Olinguito. Yesterday, we uh, announced and, and revealed this animal to the world, gave it its scientific name, uh, and, and told what little we already know about the animal. Now, we don't know that it's in any zoos right now. Uh, we told a story uh, in our paper and uh, in our press release about an animal that was in a zoo in the 1960s and 70s, but that animal is no longer with us. Um, but it was in Olinguito, and no one realized it at the time. Now, um, Miguel, are you aware of any uh, animals in zoos down in South America? Um, indeed, actually, uh, yesterday during our press release, uh, Juan Manuel Carrion, the director of the zoo in Quito, um, he mentioned that uh, they don't have any Olinguito in the zoo, and actually he hopes never to have one, and the reason for that is because all the animals in the Quito Zoo have been rescued from uh, wildlife uh, poachers of uh, trafficking activities. So he really uh, hopes never to face to rescue an Olinguito. And well, that is the site that we have here. Um, for the uh, and yes, it would be a uh, really good 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 stuff that um, the Olinguito is wouldn't be a victim of a uh, of a uh, poachers of uh, hunters. I'll just add one thing, which is that uh, I bet it would be pretty tricky to actually get one, because uh, as you guys remember, when we were in the field, we climbed a lot of trees and put traps up there to try to trap one ourselves, and uh, never were able to was able to lure one in. So um, it would take some work, maybe some experimentation to figure out what, what food could actually be used to lure them in. The bananas that we tried uh, didn't work. I just want to add one last thing with this question, because we've had a lot of questions about Olinguitos in zoos, past and present. And I just want to say that I won't be completely surprised if we hear from any zoos in Colombia that they may actually have Olinguitos already. I was wondering if, when we made this announcement yesterday, um, getting everybody looking more closely at Olingos and Olinguitos, if every zoo in the world that has Olingos 
is running out back to check and make sure that those Olingos aren't actually Olinguitos. So uh, stay tuned. We Maybe we're going to hear from some zoos that once they look closer like we did, they see um, that some other cases of mistaken identity. Well, All and right. Chris, on that, on that note, we've seen just in the last day uh, three or four people have sent us pictures or video of, of Olingos that they've said, hey, I got this in Ecuador or, or Colombia. Is this actually an Olinguito? And in fact, um, someone posted on YouTube what is now the first video of an Olinguito that he recorded in 2005, which is really uh, pretty cool now that people can go back and, and we, we can actually learn more about this animal by observations that have already been made. And that's amazing. Check it out on YouTube. You can see the only video we know about the Olinguito, and we didn't even know about it before yesterday. New photos and, and a new video of the animal coming in and, and just putting this animal more and more on the map. Uh, I'm going to move to another question. And this is coming from Elizabeth Kamen on Facebook. And Elizabeth asks, what is the Olinguito's closest known relative? Ooh. And uh, I'll start with that. Uh, the Olinguito, as we've mentioned, is a member of the raccoon family. Raccoon family is, in turn, one of about 15 families in the order of carnivora. Cats, dogs, bears, seals, sea lions. Raccoon is, raccoons are one of them. So uh, of the species in the raccoon family, the closest relative of the Olinguito are a group of animals called the Olingos. And this loomed large in our announcement yesterday. Until yesterday, the Olinguito had been confused with these Olingos. And there were some good reasons for that. One of them, and the principal reason, is that scientists really didn't have a handle on Olingos and how to tell them apart their classification. Pretty strange for a group of carnivora that we wouldn't already had their classification pretty well settled, but we didn't. So Olingos were pretty poorly known. How many species are there? What are their distributions? Are some of them endangered species? How do we tell them apart? And our paper that we published yesterday in Zookeys gives the answers to those questions. And it took us 10 years to solve those, those questions and those problems, but we have. And what we've shown is that of all the Olingos that anyone had ever named before, given scientific names, known what they were at any time, there's three species. There's a species in Central America, mostly Costa Rica, Panama, Nicaragua. There's a second species that's mostly found in Western South America and another in Eastern South America. So those are the three Olingos. The Olinguito is a new species in that same genus, but it's what we call the sister group to all of the Olingos. It, you can think of it as the first offshoot from the rest of them on the Olingo family tree. And it's smaller, and we can talk about other ways later about how it's different from Olingos. It's very different from Olingos, and so that's why we decided to call it the Olinguito and give it this uh, other name. Now, Roland has worked a lot on, on these relatives, Olingos. Anything you want to add to that, Roland? Well, just one of the cool things, um, going back a little bit further, that was discovered about Olingos, it used to think that Olingos and Kinkajous were actually they're each other's closest relatives because they look so similar. In fact, we had a hard time sometimes looking up in the trees and telling if it was a kinkajou or if it was an olingo. And so for a long time, we thought that olingos and kinkajous were each other's closest relative. And um, from doing some genetics, we realized that's actually not the case at all. And they've just converged. It's evolutionary convergence on this, this same sort of morphology, the same appearance, the same long tail. This, you know, and that's because they're both in the trees climbing around at night eating fruit. Anything to add, Miguel? Uh, I think pretty much you guys um, cover everything about the evolutionary relationships of the Olinquitos, I think. Uh, great, great. I well, can... I'll, move, I'll move on, and, but just um, mention before we do that the, the raccoon family in entirety are the raccoons, the coatis, the kinkajous, the ringtails, the olingos, and now the Olinguito, the latest edition. So uh, that answers the questions of its, its most common or most closely uh, related animal, the Olingo. So uh, I'm going to move on to another question. Let's, let's fit some more in, and this is coming from Nancy... Murphy Davis on Facebook. And Nancy says that in 2005, uh, she visited uh, Belfate in Honduras. I think that's how to pronounce it. But she was in Honduras, and she saw an animal at dusk that she couldn't identify. She says this animal looked remarkably like it. It looked like an Olinguito, she's saying. Uh, is it possible that they could live there in Honduras, too? Um, I might start with that again. I would say... Very unlikely. It's, and the reason I say that is that the Olinguito is found only in a very specific kind of habitat in a very particular part of Latin America. And that is cloud forest habitats, 
from between five and, and nine thousand feet. That's about you know fifteen hundred meters up to twenty eight hundred meters uh, in the northern Andes in Colombia and Ecuador. And specifically, we're talking about particular chains of the Andes, the western uh, Cordillera and the central Cordillera in Colombia and Ecuador. And in our study of the Olenguito, we've realized that that geography has been very important to the evolution of the Olenguito. It's become uh, isolated up in the mountains and isolated between different mountain ranges. Uh, you may have heard that we didn't just name a new species the Olenguito, we recognized four different kinds of Olenguito. And that was maybe one of the most exciting parts of this project. We had not only a new species that was a major evolutionary branch, but we were able to recognize four different kinds of Olenguito. So is it possible yet another kind of Olenguito lives in Honduras? Unlikely, but it's possible that what you saw was another member of the raccoon family. And there are some, some candidates in, in Honduras. Um, a possibility was that you saw um, a caca missile, kind of uh, animal in the ringtail genus, which is uh, about the size of an Olingo and has a banded tail. Um, we're still trying to figure out whether Olingos actually extend into Honduras. Not the Olinguito, but a similar animal called Olingos. Uh, anyone want to speak to that? Yeah, no, I think that's a really important point, actually. Olingos in Honduras. We don't have any vouchers, uh, records of Olingos in, in, in Honduras. There have been some visual reports, and people have said, this is what I think I saw, and they've described it really well, but without a voucher, we can't say for sure. So we, we, we don't actually know for sure that Olingos get that far north. So uh, any photographs of Olingos in Honduras would be great to let us verify. You know, I'm, I'm almost sure it's not an Olinguito, but rather it is the Olingo that ranges, you know, further south into Costa Rica, or rather it's, like you said, Chris, a ringtail or maybe a kinkajou. Um, it would be really important to know just does the Olingo go that far north? Yeah, so maybe, maybe a, a member of the ringtail or kinkajou genus, or maybe a... Um in a, di a, a new locality for, for uh, the Olingo grouping it itself. So pictures, pictures from Honduras and Guatemala uh, for Olingos oh, and for Olinguitos, Kinkajus, Olingos, all of these animals, hard to tell apart when you just see them in the wild, even from a picture sometimes. So collecting as many pictures as possible from these animals from as many parts of Latin America as possible, that's going to help Miguel and Roland and myself really uh, piece apart uh, what the exact distributions of these animals are. Still a lot to learn. Uh, I'm going to move on to the last question in English, and then we'll move on to the Spanish portion. But uh, this is coming from uh, Chloe H. Uh, on Google+. And she says, what's the status of the area where the Olinguito has been found? Uh, if not now, will it be made a protected area for future scientific studies on the new species? Um, the area where it was found is um, called Otanga Cloud Forest Reserve. That's where we first found the animal in the wild. And that was thanks entirely to Miguel. And so, Miguel, do you want to tell us a little bit about that, that forest? Absolutely. Um, this is a wonderful forest. Actually, it seems to be a pull out, out of a movie, out of a movie with elves and, and you know, I, I am actually thinking, oh, what it would be looking at, at the forest, and it could be like a, one of those scenes in those uh, very uh, close forests in uh, the Lord of the Rings movies, probably, or some similar situations, when you see all these uh, trees covered with mosses and clouds uh, from all over the place. It's just a fantastic uh, feeling to be walking on those forests. And actually, why uh, we picked those forests, it was, it was because of the information that was already in the museum specimens on the tags on the localities, and we were worried because uh, that habitat, the Andean cloud forest, had been uh, heavily impacted by human activities. So at the beginning, we were even worried that the Olinguito could be already extinct before receiving a proper description. So um, we went to the field, and the, one of the first uh, things that we did was picking um, forest, remnant forests with a good quality of habitat. And uh, among those, first on the list was Otonga. So I uh, spearheaded uh, over there uh, a couple of weeks before uh, Chris and Roland arrived to Ecuador, and uh, just armed with, um, with a video camera with a nice shot uh, function, I could uh, just grab these uh, very few seconds of an Olinguito jumping from a tree to another, to another tree. That was a fantastic feeling. 
I remember those probably were the longest five seconds in my life, probably looking at that little little creature. And uh, immediately I could see it. It was an olinguito, and it was not a kinkajou. That was the other eruption over there. I could see the fluffy tail, uh, not prehensile, and with the faint uh, rings on the tail, and the small size. That that was the combination of characters that told me that was an olinguito. So there, I mean, there you have it. Otonga Cloud Forest Reserve is a protected area, uh, and uh, that's where the Olinguito, at least where we, our team, first encountered it uh, in the wild. Um, we also know of it uh, from um, connecting with colleagues in, in Ecuador and Colombia. We know that the uh, Olinguito can be found in several other protected areas as well. And uh, Tandayapa, is that an area that has some protection? Uh, Miguel, this is where we've been getting some photographs and film. Absolutely. Tandayapa um, is an uh, entire valley, and there are several um, preserved reserves there. And the good thing is all of them are contiguous. And the, and the area where the pictures were taken is the a bird lodge that they have a fruit feeder for uh, birds. But uh, once in a while, olinguitos go there and snitch the, the, the fruit out of the, of the birds. Uh, which is quite interesting, and um, and also it happens as well that the the director of the zoo has uh, another reserve uh, contiguous to it, and he mentions that he has seen um, several animals in in his property, and he imagines that uh, some of those are also the olinguitos. So I uh, guess an extension of that land is actually uh, larger than Otonga, so also it contributes that for the near future at least the the olinguito. Uh, conservation is, uh, to some sense, is uh, secure. So or not. That's, that's good news. Yeah. Well, now I have a question for you, though. Extending this one, broadly speaking, across Ecuador, uh, these these lands that are still forested in the, in the cloud forest are they more public or privately owned? Oh, mostly are privately owned. Actually, there are uh, very few um, public reserves there. So the good thing is that with um, because we are now realizing that the forests are so important for us. Um, several uh, people is um, buying uh, old farms and let the forest regrow, which is a fantastic activity, and people are more encouraged to do so. So, so good, some, so, you know, good news, some heartening news. Uh, when we reported for the first time um, the discovery or the the realization of this olinguito as a distinct species, uh, we were able to report that it doesn't seem to be an endangered species. So. Some good news coming from Ecuador and Colombia there, and, and we just mentioned some protected areas in Ecuador, and we have uh, evidence that uh, Olinguitos live in, in some protected areas in Colombia as well, but we have uh, very little uh, first-hand information uh, coming to us about places in Colombia where, uh, where we can find Olinguitos right now today, but uh, there certainly will be some, and uh, we're looking forward to uh, any information that anyone can give us, so colleagues in in Colombia, uh, we're looking for more information, and, and uh, so much of the range of the Olinguito and three of the four subspecies of the Olinguito that we have identified are found only in Colombia. So, very, very important uh, country there uh, for Olinguito conservation. Um, it, last thing I'll mention is that even though we're not calling it an endangered species, um, there are threats to its habitat, and we've, we've talked about the importance of cloud forests, and deforestation is the main threat to Olinguitos, and so uh, you might think these forests are very remote, high up in the mountains and not a place where people would ever infringe on the Olinguito, but that's not true. Some of these areas, um, there are lots of people, and there's uh, agricultural expansion, even cities up in the mountains, and so uh, uh, we'll keep an eye on the situation with the Olinguito, and its status may change with time, but we can hope that it remains uh, not endangered. Okay, so thank you for those uh, English questions. So the Spanish portion of the program here. We, so Miguel has another hangout window open uh, from our moderator. He's going to use uh, that to read some questions in Spanish. And uh, let's get started on our 30 minutes of uh, Spanish questions and answers. Um, so um, uh, Miguel, are you seeing that? No, I don't see the other uh, window. Just so make sure uh, we're getting that up uh, there so we can get the Spanish one. questions coming in. Okay. Did you guys send me an invitation for I, I, think, uh, I think Chris is going to read them in English and Miguel is going to translate. Okay. 
Well, let's okay. do it that way. Okay, so I'm going to read some questions in English, and Miguel uh, can translate for us. So, um, ahora comienza la poción en español. Okay. Uh, <laughs> bueno, la mala. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I, uh, here, here's a question that's coming from um, R. Lavery 20 on YouTube, and and uh, they're asking. They say, "I heard you used DNA to confirm the Olenguito as a separate species. I have heard of using this method with cryptic species. Is the Olenguito a cryptic species?" Miguel, take it away. Oh, yeah, not at all. The Olenguito no, is not. A it is um, very. Uh, oh, Miguel, easy. we need the question translated in Spanish now. Oh, 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 oh I see, I see. <laughs> so, so the la pregunta es um, que la, la la persona nos ha preguntado si el ADN que ha oído que el ADN se utiliza para separar uh, para diferenciar entre especies. Uh, principalmente en especies crípticas y nos pregunta que como nosotros utilizamos uh, también análisis de ADN nos pregunta si es que el olinguito es una especie críptica la respuesta a esa pregunta es uh, no el olinguito no es una especie críptica se la reconoce fácilmente de sus uh, otros congéneres de los otros de los olingos por el tamaño pequeño es mucho más pequeño por el color tiene un color uh, más brillante que varía desde rojizo a gris y también es um, más peludo. También otra, otra, um, otra dif diferencia de los olingos con los olinguitos es el largo del hocico. Los olinguitos tienen un hocico muy comprimido, reducido, con que les da la apariencia que la cabeza es prácticamente redonda, mientras que los olingos tienen un, un hocico un poco más largo, casi como la de un perro, como que sí, casi como la de un perro. Entonces, esas diferencias uh, nos, uh, externas nos indican que el olinguito no es una especie críptica. Sin embargo, los análisis de ADN fueron muy útiles para entender las relaciones evolutivas entre los olingos y el olinguito y también con el resto de miembros de la familia de los mapaches. Great, yeah. So, the olinguito, olinguito quite a, a, a distinctive uh, animal. There. Oh, yeah. Uh, before we go on, I, I just thought, uh, for those that may have just been joining us for the Spanish uh, part of the program, we might just kind of start again and, and uh, introduce ourselves. Um, so I, I, if we can go around, I'll just say, uh, soy Chris Helgen, a la Smithsonian, Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. Rolando? Sí, me, me llamo Rolando Keyes, del Museo uh, de Ciencia Natural in uh, North Carolina, y también el uh, Universidad de North Carolina State University. Uh, mi nombre es Miguel Pinto, soy de Ecuador, soy un investigador asociado a la Pontificia Universidad Católica del Ecuador y también soy un estudiante de doctorado en el Museo Americano de Historia Natural y en CUNY, la Universidad de la Ciudad de Nueva York. Bien. ¿Cuál es la, la próxima pregunta? All right. Next question, Chris. Yeah, let me let me jump in on, on another question, and Miguel will translate. Uh, the question is from Nathan at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, okay. and his question is, what is the Olinguito's most unique feature? The most unique feature. Okay, la pregunta es um, uh, de, uh, de Nathan desde el Museo de Carolina del Norte. Um, ¿Cuál es la característica más única del olinguito? Y esa es una pregunta difícil porque el olinguito uh, tiene muchas características únicas. Uh, diríamos que la, la más única, uh, bueno, que la única sería su, la, la coloración de su pelaje. Esta coloración entre rojiza y, y gris es uh, realmente increíble. Como ustedes han visto en las fotografías, es un animal muy lindo por esta, por esta coloración. Y bueno, y esa coloración también está asociada con el pelaje, con este pelaje exuberante, ¿no? Que parece como, como, que, como que le ha pasado por un secador de pelo, ¿verdad? Con, 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 con aire caliente, todo, todo esponjadito. Entonces, es un animal muy, muy lindo, pero sí, digamos que su característica principal sería el color, la coloración. Okay. Yeah, maybe uh, since, since, since Nathan might not speak Spanish and he asked the question, maybe we could just summarize that. Oh, okay. <laughs> probably, no, that was good. But just quickly, even though we're in the Spanish section, for Nathan in particular, uh, sitting out there, uh, the red color is probably, I mean, that's when you look at it, 
you see that, that the fur is, is red compared to the other lingos and also very sort of woolly. It's much thicker uh, and heavier, which makes sense when you think about this animal living at higher elevation where it's much colder than the other lingos that are sort of down in the hot, humid, sweaty tropics, sweaty lowland tropics. Okay, so that, that fur color, especially, that rich, richly colored fur. I'm going to ask another question, and we'll, we'll give it over to Miguel, and then maybe we can have it, the, the, the question in Spanish and, and the answer, and then uh, maybe uh, uh, answer in English as well. So uh, this is coming from Facebook, the fa a Facebook user called, uh, named Bell No, and the question is, and I have to say this is a question I've been hearing uh, quite a bit lately, and that's, uh, will the Olinguito make a good pet? Is it going to be a good pet? And we have some questions that follow on. Uh, you know, and these are questions you need to know about a pet. What what does it eat? And will it sleep in the bed with me and not scratch my eyes out? Those are those are important questions for any pet. So, um, what what what's uh, over to you, Miguel, to answer that question first? We'll translate it first. <laughs> okay. So um, so in Spanish, do you guys want me to? Do you yeah. want to start that line? Yeah, let's have, let's okay. have the answer, or the, the translation oh, yeah. question. Okay, translate the question. So the question, uh, la pregunta es, um, si el olinguito sería una buena mascota, y también, bueno, esta pregunta tiene otras preguntas asociadas, como por ejemplo, ¿qué come el olinguito? Y si es que dormiría en la cama, ¿no? A como un perrito, y, y ¿cuál es la posibilidad de que saque los ojos al dueño. <ríe> Entonces, bueno, la, la pregunta uh, sería, no, el olinguito no sería una buena mascota porque no conocemos nada de su biología. No sabemos si es dócil, no sabemos si le gustaría vivir en una casa. En realidad no sabemos incluso qué frutas en, eh, son las que, las que componen su dieta en total. Solo sabemos que algunas pocas frutas uh, eh, come, pero no sabemos qué más con, está consumiendo, ¿no? Y también qué insectos podría comer o, o, bueno, son otras cosas que nos indicarían por el momento que no, que sería, no sería una buena mascota, una mala idea por el momento. Sí, también Roland. está activad, um, act, um, activo por todo de la noche, entonces <risa> no, está, no, no va a dormir en su cama con, contigo porque va a correr por todo de su casa y también probablemente no va a usar el baño. Entonces, en, en la mañana cuando tú despiertate, vas a ver el, el jeces en todo de su casa. <laughs> so, yeah, so tell us now in English, no, in it, English it, it, those, it, those caveats about the Olinguito as a pet. Well, so it's up all night and it can't be potty trained. And so <laughs> not going to sleep in bed with you. And, um, you know, worse than scratching your eyes out, I think it's just going to leave its little deposits all over your house. Of, of whatever fruit you've been feeding it. And I like to say it, it makes a better stuffed animal than it makes a pet. Oh, cool. And uh, I, think, I think hopefully we can all agree that it's the Olinguito as a, a wild animal of the cloud forest is best left there in the cloud forest and not, not brought into our, our home as a pet. But the last thing I'll answer with, with that question is you know, asking about scratching eyes out. and. Everyone who's seen these pictures head-on of the Olinguito sees that it's an adorable animal, but then they look down a little bit at the branch and they see that this animal has some sharp claws. And so uh, you hear that it, it's, a, it's in a carnivore group of mammals and it has these sharp claws. So people say, it looks cute, but is it dangerous? And that's what we're hearing. And I don't think this animal is dangerous at all, but none of us know the Olinguito very well yet. And those sharp claws, I should say, are a feature of pretty much any animal any mammal that lives up in the trees. They have kind of strong, grasping paws, and those, uh, those claws are really just to uh, 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 facilitate this animal's lifestyle in the trees. So I wouldn't worry about uh, too much about this animal coming after you with those claws. That's just the way the Olinguito is. Um, I'm going to uh, take an, this next question. I'll, I'll read it in English. And um, this is a question that's close to my heart, so I might answer it in English and then uh, turn it over to the other gentleman for uh, uh, translating the question and answer uh, and, uh, and uh, stepping in with, with more information. So the question is coming from a Google Plus user, Deb B. And uh, Deb is asking, any idea of the range and numbers? Uh, so the range of the Olinguito and numbers. And uh, she says that we've heard you designated three subspecies. Uh, is one more common than the others? Well, I think all of us can answer this question 
in different ways. What I will say is um, uh, there must be quite a lot of Olinguitos out there. And the way that we know that is if we look at the range where we know that Olinguitos probably or definitely occur, it covers quite a bit of cloud forest ground in the Andes in Colombia and Ecuador. And some of these areas, like we've mentioned earlier, are protected areas. So when you look at that area and how it stretches out across the Andes, uh, there really have to be, if we think about the numbers, Olinguitos in the many, many thousands. Now, we don't have any hard numbers. Uh, I'd love to see uh, those studies improve, those, those very extrapolative figures improve so that we have a better idea of exactly where Olinguitos are, where they aren't, where they're protected, where they're not, and that'll give us a better idea. But there's thousands of them out there. There have to be. There, um, Deb says, you know, there's multiple subspecies. Uh, three subspecies have been now named by our team in addition to what we call the nominate subspecies, the subspecies that's called Becerra cyan neblina neblina. So Becerra cyan neblina uh, is the scientific name of the Olinguito. And there's three additional scientific names for those three additional subspecies, a total of four. So as we mentioned, one of those subspecies is known only from Ecuador so far, basically the Ecuadorian range, and three from Colombia. And of the three Colombian, two of those Colombian subspecies so far, we only know them from one major region, one particular area um, of the Andean slopes. So what the kind of Olinguito that's most widespread and that probably has the largest population is one of the Colombian subspecies. It's the subspecies that's called Osborne's Olinguito, uh, Becerra cyan neblina osborni, and that animal, uh, we've been able to reconstruct its range as occurring uh, over the eastern slopes of the western Andes uh, and the western slopes of the central Andes and coming together, I think, uh, along those chains sort of at at middle elevations, uh, so separated by a valley, but uh, this long running uh, series of slopes seems to be the home of Osborne's Olinguito. So that's the one that's most common. Um, uh, Roland, do you want to talk to, to the, the size of the range, the area that, that we've been able to calculate that Olinguitos seem to occur? Well, we, we so we have some guesses, right, from the few specimens we have, and uh, um, when we intersect our guesses with where the habitat might have already been destroyed, uh, we find in total we're guessing about 40,000 square kilometers of, of, of Olinguito forest, which is which sounds pretty good, but it's still, that's very much a first guess, and a lot of these areas we need to have, um, you know, ourselves or somebody go and verify if the Olingos are actually there, if the Olinguito is actually there. Some places we think they're there, they might not actually be there. Other places we're saying, well, it looks like good habitat, but we have no references, no material, no specimens from there, so we just don't know. It might not be. So we could end up finding that this range is much smaller or much bigger than our first guess of 40,000 square kilometers. Um, and uh, I think, like, like you said, you know, there's definitely thousands of them, but the interesting thing about these subspecies is just how much variation there was within this species. So um, it's surprising to have a new species be described with four different subspecies. And what that means is we found variations in the way they look, in their skulls and in their skins, that suggest that um, it's, uh, it's, really a, uh, it's really a dynamic group, and it might be quite a, you know, it's definitely an old group, and some of these divisions uh, might be millions of years old between subspecies. That's a great point. Those subspecies, they look to us like different gene pools. And so when we think about whether Olinguitos are endangered, what we probably should really be thinking about is whether those subspecies are individually endangered. And these kinds of detailed assessments are going to be the next step for the Olinguito and its conservation. Miguel, can you jump in and, and uh, pose the question and, and explain uh, the range and the numbers on Olinguitos? Yes. La pregunta es, um, ¿cuántas uh, que la, 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 pregunta, la, la persona que escuchó uh, preguntó que se descubrieron tres subespecies de Olinguitos Entonces, ¿cuál es la distribución y cuántos olinguitos hay en la naturaleza? Entonces, una pregunta complicada. Sabemos por los, museos, por los especímenes de museo en la distribución y es aproximadamente de 4.000 kilómetros um, cuadrados en los Andes de Ecuador y Perú. Eh, no, pero no solo se describieron tres especies, sino en total son cuatro especies. Ahora, la más abundante eh, podría ser um, Basarisium neblina osborni, 
que vive en los, en los uh, valles centrales de los Andes de Colombia, entre la, las, las laderas occidentales, eh, orientales de la cordillera occidental y las laderas uh, occidentales de la cordillera central. Entonces, en todo este valle estarían los olinguitos en las, en las, en las estribaciones. Ahora, eh, eh, posiblemente esta sea la más común uh, por, eh, en base a los, a los datos que hemos visto. Sin embargo, uh, Roland menciona que, que más estudios son necesarios para, para, para en realidad uh, saber los números poblacionales y es posible que las distribuciones de las otras especies incluso se extiendan. Y, y bueno, a pesar de los números, es uh, importante recalcar que, que es, eh, la, la variación dentro de los olinguitos es increíble. A pesar de que el rango no es muy grande, ¿verdad? 4.000 kilómetros eh, cuadrados no es muy grande, pero la, la, la variación de los olinguitos en este terreno es altísima. Y es sorprendente que no se ha no sean descrito esta especie que tiene tanta variación dentro de la especie. Pues tienen la coloración, desde esta coloración rojiza, casi rojiza intensa, hasta esta coloración grisácea, eh, que hacen de los olinguitos unos animales únicos. Ok, uh, bueno, te, tengo uh, otra pregunta aquí uh, para Miguel. Uh, esta pregunta es de uh, Google Plus, uh, Deb, Deb Bay, uh, de Google Plus. Y él dice... En las noticias de esta mañana, Ecuador permitirá la extracción de petróleo en la Amazonia. ¿Qué impacto tendrá esto en estos y otros animales únicos? Esa es una muy buena observación. Uh, lamentablemente, eh, la noche de ayer, eh, el presidente Rafael Correa eh, abrió la explotación petrolera en el Parque Nacional Yasuní. Um, una zona que se creía intangible para la explotación petrolera y, una, y, una, y es un área de importante, muy importante para la diversidad, no solo biológica, sino también cultural, puesto que hay al menos dos grupos indígenas que, uh, que voluntariamente están en aislamiento. Entonces, um, abrir esta explotación petrolera Directamente al olinguito no, no afecta, no le afecta porque el olinguito vive a más alto, vive en las estribaciones de los Andes. Sin embargo, un primo muy cercano del olinguito, el olingo del oriente, Basarision alieni, está distribuido en el Parque Nacional Yasuní y sus números obviamente van a reducir. Pero más que el impacto en los olingos, el impacto real viene a ser en la calidad del agua y en la calidad del ambiente de la Amazonía. Eh, sinceramente es, va a ser una catástrofe ambiental lo que va a ocurrir si es que no se toman las medidas necesarias para una extracción uh, que sea lo más limpia posible. En realidad el futuro está un poco incierto en esto, pero al menos sabemos que el olinguito directamente no va a ser afectado, pero sí, vamos a perder mucho del resto de la, de, de la diversidad biológica que tenemos. Ok. Bueno, yo, yo tengo uh, otra pregunta. Uh, esto es de usuario de Google Plus, uh, Dwin Cobb, y él dice, ¿qué come el olinguito? Y uh, yo puedo em empezar, el, el ol olinguito um, come fruta, pensamos, uh, mayormente fruta. Nosotros encontramos uh, los ol olinguitos en, en los árboles comiendo um, especialmente uh, ficus, uh, fruto de los ficus varias espacios, unas uh, pequeño y verde y otro muy, muy grande y rojo. Um, no sabemos, es posible que el olinguito come otras cosas también porque tiene dientes que son similares a otros animales que se comen uh, insectos o um, animales pequeños como aves o, o huevos, pero hasta ahora no sabemos, hay, hay mucho más que necesitamos um, descubrir de olinguitos. Y de los olingos también, tampoco no sabemos mucho de que, de que comen los olinguitos, los olingos ni los olinguitos. Uh, Miguel, ¿tiene otra cosa? Um, sí, justamente ayer un colega nuestro nos envió una foto muy oscura de un olingo en un árbol de secropia. Las secropias son estos árboles que son los primeros en crecer cuando el bosque está en regeneración. Entonces, de aquí se sacan dos datos muy interesantes. Este olinguito estaba en esta secropia comiendo los frutos 
Y también que el olinguito estaba en esta secropia, es decir, estaba al borde del bosque, no en el bosque primario. Lo que nos indica que también hasta cierto punto el olinguito se adapta a los lugares abiertos. Además, por cierto, a leyendo las etiquetas de algunos especímenes de museo, podemos confirmar que algunos de esos especímenes uh, fueron colectados en áreas, que, en, en áreas de pequeños cultivos. Por ejemplo, un olinguito uh, fue colectado en un uh, cultivo de maíz. Uh, eso también nos indica que el olinguito a veces llega a los cultivos de las casas. Bueno, entonces la, 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 las historias que estamos aprendiendo sobre el olinguito uh, están aumentando y eso es muy bueno, estamos aprendiendo más de la biología de esta especie. Y, y, y Miguel, un, un punto más de esto, si, si el olinguito está comiendo mucha fruta y está moviendo entre eh, la um, cultivación y el bosque, es importante porque va a mover la, las semillas de los árboles del bosque, uh, así el bosque se puede, um, ¿cómo se dice? Rejuvenate, the regrowth of the forest. Um, Sí, los bosques van a rejuvenecer y van a crecer los bosques en donde antes se había cortado el bosque para tener pastizales, por ejemplo. Sí, es muy buen punto, Roland. Bueno. I want to uh, jump in for, for the, maybe for the English speakers if I can, yeah. just uh, yeah, yeah, good. the question being, you know, what, what does the Olinguito eat? And uh, again, remember, we're just learning uh, for the first time about the Olinguito, but what we've been able to find so far and and uh, what um, uh, Miguel and Roland were telling us about is we, we know the Olinguito eats fruit. That's what we've seen it eating. That's the evidence we have um, from, from uh, all the sources so far. Um, and I want to clarify something. A lot of people are asking, it's a carnivore, but it's eating fruit. It's a member of the order Carnivora. It evolved from a meat-eating ancestor, the Olinguito and the Olingos. Um, but, uh, um, and all members of the raccoon family that have been discovered previously do eat some meat. The related Olingos eat some small animals. They also eat some insects. And we suspect that that's going to be true for the Olinguito, even though we haven't done the studies, invested times in, uh, time in the, in the field studying Olinguitos to see it doing those things. Um, some of the other members of the family also uh, like to drink nectar, um, a high energy uh, food, and we expect that the Olinguito Um, will likely do that as well. I will say, um, uh, in studying the anatomy of the Olinguito, it has bigger, chunkier molars than Olingos do, and that might suggest that it has more plants in the diet than, uh, than uh, uh, Olingos do. So it may even be less carnivorous or less omnivorous than Olingos. We, may, we might find that the Olinguito is one of the uh, most uh, fruit-eating specialist Uh, carnivores. And the uh, last thing I'll mention about it is it, it might be possible to study it not just in the field, but using museum specimens like those we have at Smithsonian here to, um, to study stable isotopes, basically the chemistry in uh, preserved bones and skins, um, to give some idea of how much animal versus uh, uh, plant matter all of these different kinds of raccoon relatives, including the Olinguito, are eating. Great. That's great. So um, if I may jump, I just got a question from uh, through Facebook. Uh, they are asking uh, why uh, we named it Olinguito and just not call it like another Olingo. Um, so la, la pregunta que recibí a través de, de Facebook de Melissa, de Melissa Moreano nos uh, pregunta por qué llamamos al Olinguito Olinguito y por qué no lo llamamos simplemente Olingo si es que también es un miembro del mismo género. Y la pregunta en realidad, es la respuesta es uh, muy personal. El olinguito, la llamamos olinguito porque es más pequeño, es más chiquito que los uh, olingos uh, normales y además es más bonito. Entonces uh, utilizamos este diminutivo, el olinguito. Um, I don't know if you guys have uh, additional explanations for uh, why we choose olinguito instead of another olingo. <laughs> Roland, any thoughts there? Well, I was just laughing because Miguel just said it's more beautiful. It's so much more beautiful than the other lingos that it deserves its own name. <laughs> I have to I have to agree on. Um, you know, it does. It it, it is um, physically. You have the the three lowland lingos, and then you have the olinguito. It, it does look quite a bit different. And um, interestingly, you know, the genetics showed the same thing that that the olinguito is the the basal group. That means it broke off from the rest of the lingos, and they kept evolving their way, and the olinguito evolved its way a long, long time ago. So it is deserving. Um, in a, you know, a number of different ways you can look at it. It is deserving of a new, uh, of a new, um, of a new name all its, all its own. And I, I want to give a few words on that too because I, I like the name Olinguito. It's, uh, 
it's a very fitting for this animal. And, and um, I want to reemphasize that we weren't just kind of drawing any arbitrary boundaries or splitting hairs when we say the Olingito is you know, different than the other Oling Olingos. It's out on a very distant uh, evolutionary branch, close enough that we still classify it in the same genus. But we're talking about three or four million years of, of independent evolution along the line. Uh, that gave rise to the Olingito. And so a lot of a lot of separation, genetic separation. And so just like we, you know, we call we call a leopard and jaguar jaguar different names. Now, one's not the uh, American uh, leopard. They're different names. And we thought we let's do that service to the Olingito too. Really recognize it with a different name. And also, you know, in Spanish we have ito, diminutive. That I mean can be little, but maybe also a term of affection. We call Miguel Miguelito sometimes, a term of affection or adorableness, like Miguel right there at that smile. So uh, the Olinguito is sort of the little or the adorable Olingo, and uh, that's that's what we've called it. I, let's, let's finish up here, and uh, um, uh, I'm seeing a last question, and I think, I think the way we can, this is a great way to end it, uh, this question. I think what we can do is, uh, I can uh, pose the question and maybe we all three of us can answer it and uh, um, I'll answer it in English and Miguel in Spanish and Roland you can take your pick. That's not good. Why don't we start with, I'll, I'll, I'll take, I'll give it to you first Miguel and uh, you can just repeat the question and give the answer and the question is you know what was your initial reaction on discovering that this was a new species? Miguel. Bueno, la pregunta es, ¿cuál fue nuestra reacción inicial cuando nos enteramos de esta nueva especie? Y bueno, uh, creo que no hay palabras para describir ese sentimiento. Uh, uh, personalmente me llené de mucha alegría y fue un honor a uh, ser parte de esta investigación en que estamos uh, compilando más información para dar al mundo a conocer sobre esta especie. Entonces, sí, estábamos, bueno, estaba tan feliz, me imagino como se siente tal vez un actor al ganar un Oscar o, o qué sé yo, o un uh, escritor al publicar una novela. Imagino que fue un sentimiento, fue una, una alegría muy, muy, muy grande. Ron. Ok, so I'll, I'll do English. Uh, um, and so, so for me, uh, you know, Chris had already done the museum homework and had, had recognized the specimens, and I think you'll probably talk about that here in a, in a second. So for me, it was at the mammal meetings, Chris and I, and I, I think Miguel was there as well, were, we were talking at the American Society of Mammalogists, and Chris, I had done work on Olingos, and Chris was telling me that, that he had found this, this, this new Olingo that he was pretty sure was, was a new species, and I remember sitting in this sort of evening social event and just being like, on one hand, like, who is this guy, and, you know, sort of dubious. And so, but at the same time, like, you know, excited about it, that, like, wow, you know, because I was in love with the lingos before the, Olingo, before the Olinguito came along, and the idea that there would be a new, a new Olingo was just, it was crazy to me. So, for me, I think the real, you know, there was sort of that moment of excited, dubious, but when we got to go to the field and got to go into the forest and actually walk out and uh, in the night with the headlamps and the binoculars and trucking up and down hills and finding this fig tree and looking up in the fig tree and seeing the, the Olinguito, um, you know, sort of shaking with the binoculars to try to get it into view. And, and, and it was so obvious even from that that it was so different. And it was just like, wow. It, and uh, so excited to, uh, to, to see that. And also, you know, thankful for Chris for sort of inviting me in to be part of this discovery, which was really exciting. Well, this is the first time hearing this full story. I don't know if I should have invited Roland in after I hear that he was so dubious of, of this discovery. Uh, but uh, I, I, I will say that, uh, you know, for me, uh, this has been maybe the most you know, exciting scientific project that I've ever been a part of. And one of those reasons is that, you know, you talk about an initial reaction. Uh, I've been able to have two... Uh, of these kind of eureka moment reactions in this project. The first one came uh, when I, and it really was a eureka moment when I pulled open uh, the drawer in the field museum and saw and realized what these skins and skulls were for the first time. They were a major branch of the raccoon family tree that no zoologist had ever recognized. And I, I knew that once I, uh, that first day, those first few minutes that I was uh, excitedly looking through this drawer and seeing them. And uh, even better. I mean, as if it could get better, it was even better when we used the clues from those museum specimens, 
to understand what habitats these animals live in and where we should go to look, and that uh, is owed to Miguel. We gave him that information. He brought us to the right place, and it was all three of us together on the first night that we were all down there uh, at, at Otonga Cloud Forest Reserve that we all um, first encountered the Olangita in the wild. So from the museum door into the wild, um, elation, you know, finding these uh, these discoveries, and I, I got to discover the Olangito in some ways twice, or at least uh, um, see it see it uh, in, in new ways twice. So I think uh, um, I want to thank everybody for um, um, jumping in with us and joining us on this Google Hangout today. This has been uh, been fun. Thanks, Roland, Miguel, and and uh, um, uh, I'll let Miguel uh, close us off in Spanish. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well. Um... Bueno, muchas gracias a todos por um, conectarse a este Google Hangout. Ha sido uh, muy, muy emotivo uh, para nosotros uh, recapitular un poco sobre el sufrimiento del Olingo. Y bueno, gracias a todos por participar. Y bueno, Chris uh, y Roland también, muchas gracias por organizar esto. Ha sido fantástico. Bueno. Muy bien. Chris, Chris, do you want to mention your Reddit thing? Yeah, let me, let me say that. I just want to say thanks for all the great questions from everybody, English. Spanish and sorry we, we uh, can't ever get to all of them uh, but uh, you can follow uh, Smithsonian on Twitter and if anyone wants to ask more questions I'm going to be uh, following on with a reddit ask me anything that's going to begin right now once we uh, once we shut down the hangout so stay tuned and, and come and join us on the reddit ask me anything and I'll keep answering questions about the Olenguito. Yeah, and hey just to mention anyone here in here in Raleigh I'll be doing a, a talk here in the museum at uh, at two o'clock on the Olinguito. so I'll be giving another overview of that. No rest, no rest for the team here. Roland, good luck. No stop. The, Olingo, the Olinguito has its day. Alright, Miguel down in yeah. Quito. Nice to talk to you. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you guys. Okay, okay gracias. Bye, adios. Adios. <laughs> adios.